contributors to the spirit of that time as a journalist, a very insightful, and uh, uh, a, a prime mover type of person. He was a mover and shaker. He established the first uh, Black Press Association, the Associated Negro Press, and uh, it was all part of something which many call the Harlem Renaissance or the Renaissance, and uh, Frank Marshall Davis was very much part of that. Frank Marshall Davis. In the July heat off Kapiolani Boulevard, in your hollow tile one bedroom apartment, you're uncomfortable wanting to move on stronger legs, desiring metaphysical strength that would lift you from your Herculean recliner. You're sitting, one leg propped up never alone among your own photographs, still unfaded after some 50 years. Sitting in front of the television, a six-foot frame bound to the worn chair, legs swollen and humid as the insides of your room in which you swelter. You're not quite alone. The young visit you, black, brown, yellow, white, surrounding you. I imagine you speaking, a gravelly voice, low, steady, and still hip, your arm moving. Frank Marshall Davis, writer. This is more or less my own epitaph, which was written quite a few years ago, back in the 30s. And it uh, seeks to explain what I am all about. He is bitter, a bitter, bitter cynic, they said, and his wine he brews from wormwood. I was black, and black I always, I always was. was. From the ebony house of me, I watched days swing into weeks, to months, to years. I hunted golden orchids where all men are created free and equal and my skin lay raw and sore from the poison ivy of discrimination and the hidden brambles of Jim Crow. I say no sensitive Negro can spend his life in America without finding his cup holds vinegar and his meat is seasoned with gall. A Mississippi man pack, mobbing bent, beat a tin pan bedlam when I would pluck sweet airs from a muse's harp. I aimed my eyes at the holy doors of a white man's church, and I heard God's servants say, niggas must be saved elsewhere. While thousands cheered as the governor of Georgia thundered, stand pat on the Constitution, I saw the hungry mouths of six guns daring his black folk to come to the polls and vote. I turned to what was called my own race, and I looked at a white man's drama acted by inky performers. I was a weaver of jagged words, a warbler of garbled tunes, a singer of savage songs. I was bitter, yes, bitter and sorely sad. For when I wrote, I dipped my pen in the crazy heart of mad America. Wormwood wine, vinegar, gall, a daily diet, but I did not die of diabetes. His poetry was described as, as rough or as um, brutal or as, um, um, he sometimes speaks of it as stepping on corns. He, he was not uh, particularly uh, sensitive to the audience's reaction. He just wanted to portray it as he saw it. You're talking about a situation where there was not one week that went by that a black male was not lynched somewhere in the South. That was part of being black. You did not know when you went out on the street whether it would be your turn if you were a black male. You just did not know. So that all of us sort of lived in a kind of combat zone life was always at risk. I am uh, a 
a protest writer because I think that uh, the uh, history of black people in America is one of protest. And uh, they have obtained their, uh, stand, their present status by protesting and protesting and continuing to protest. So I think that it is essential if there is any desire to improve conditions. He was born in uh, uh, Arkans Arkansas, Arkansas City, Kansas, and uh, spent his years through high school there uh, in a predominantly white community with all of the uh, denigrating effects of that period of time, lynchings going on in neighboring states, riots, uh, excluded from playing sports, uh, pretty much excluded from most social activities, which meant that uh, he found the library and started to write and took English courses and the teachers liked what he was trying to do and encouraged him. In fact, I didn't do any writing at all until after my first year at Kansas State. And uh, it so happened that one of my instructors was uh, quite... Uh, one day she gave us uh, the class and the option of uh, bringing in an essay or writing an original poem by the next class. And I uh, figured that uh, I could get it done much more easily by writing an original poem. So I started, uh, wrote a, a poem, and uh, then I wrote a couple more. And anyway, if nothing else, I still didn't have to write the essay. Remember that there were about 26 black students, both male and female, at Kansas State. Uh, we were a very tiny minority. I became known as the poet who looks like a prize fighter. He had a tough guy image, all right, but this early poem shows that Frank Marshall Davis had a softer side as well. To you, gray haze of a summer afternoon, green of the Pacific Ocean, brown of oak leaves in November, and you, these are lovely things. Your eyes, more beautiful than April rainbows, your lips sweeter than old wine from Bordeaux, your touch softer than the fall of snow upon a hillside. Yet it is not for these things that I remember you. I do not love you for just your body, for bodies become old, bent, condemned. But I do say your soul is a golden chalice into which I have poured the rich red wine of mine own. We are old, yet I do not measure uh, our ages, ages by, by calendars. Out of the haze that was yesterday, out of the womb of civilization, and to the chaos that, that will be tomorrow, forever tomorrow, there comes and goes one shining white thing, very love, nothing that's world empty, nothing, only your form, your soul, nothing, these words, nothing, save a song to you. I left college in my junior years because I uh, was tired of going to college for one thing, and uh, I figured that uh, the only thing I was learning in the at Kansas State was how to operate uh, a white daily newspaper. There's no such animal <laughs> in the black uh, field. So uh, I just decided to quit going. Then uh, later, of course, I became acquainted with the uh, the whole black uh, 